Praise God. All right, thank you very much, uh, worship team. So again, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Let's look again, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. So finally, we were able to celebrate our hacks, and that's Happy Annual Thanksgiving Service last Wednesday night. Praise the Lord. Let's give everybody a hand. Thank you so much for your participation, those uh, very creative hacks, and uh, the time that we just had was just uh, enjoyable, a great way to start the new year with our, uh, with our family as a church family. And of course, we have uh, three uh, people to thank for that celebration. I call them the three wise men or the three wise women. And that's the uh, teamwork of Elena, Judy, and uh, Sister Cars. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, God, for our two sisters. They really made that possible. And so, 2014 is done. And 2015, we're already spending just a few days of this uh, brand new year. So much to thank God for uh, the past year, but so much to look forward to for this next year. Friends, if there's one word, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, would like to experience in 2015, it's the word success. I mean, who wouldn't want to be successful this year? I mean, everybody would want this year to be better than last year. Amen? Amen. Amen. So who would like to be prosperous this year? Can you raise your hand? Those who would like to be prosperous. Those who would like to succeed this year. All right. And uh, again, we're so thankful to the Lord for what is in store for us this year. Now, I realize that some people do not believe that uh, God wants us to uh, prosper. You know, that God wants us to succeed. Some people think that uh, we need to be always poor or we need to be suffering because uh, that will show so much of our humility as a Christian. But friends, I want to show you beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wants us to prosper. God wants us to succeed. In fact, here's uh, two verses for that. Joshua 1a. Let's all read this together. Everybody, read. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. So you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. And so there's a formula there. There's, there's a way that we can gain the success and have this prosperity that God does for us. We have to be careful to obey everything that is written in it. We need to take the time to allow God's word to really sink deep into our hearts. But here's another verse, and I love this one. Psalm 35, verse 27. Again, all of us, read this together. Ready, read. Let them shout for joy and rejoice, who favor my vindication, and let them say continually, the Lord be magnified, who delights in the prosperity of his servant. The Lord takes pleasure in prospering his children. You know, God, he, he make, it makes him feel so proud when his children are successful and prospering. And uh, the trouble a lot of times, especially here in North America, is we have misdefined the word prosperity. Somehow here in the Western world, when we say prosperity, we always associate it with the dollars, isn't it? We always think of our bank account. If we're prosperous, then we should have lots of money. We should have new clothes, signature clothes. We should have a brand new car, you know, the, 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 uh, all the accumulated uh, things in this world. That's the mark of prosperity as defined in this Western materialistic world. But friends, you can have lots of money in the bank and still be a dismal failure. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You may gain the whole world. You can have the, 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 the biggest bank account. You may be driving the most expensive car and still be a dismal thing. So you can have so much in your purse and nothing in your person. And that's not what prosperity according to the Bible. Others think that prosperity is the ability not to feel any pain 
You know, they think that prosperity, you should have no troubles, that you shall just sail through life with no difficulties whatsoever. Well, friends, according to the biblical definition of prosperity, that's not it. We know that there will be pain in this life because we live in a fallen world. Can you imagine living in a fallen world, man in rebellion to God, and man doesn't feel any pain? You see, God is using those pain, those big difficulties in our lives to drive us back to Him. You, you see, the reason why you receive the Lord Jesus Christ is because there was some emptiness in your life. The reason you receive the Lord Jesus Christ is because you're tired of the way you're running your life, even with all your accumulations, nothing truly satisfies. You see, that pain, that nagging pain, drove you back to the Lord. The worst thing for an unbeliever is to go through life in rebellion to God and not experiencing pain. He won't have any need for God. So pain, even pain, is a, a good gift from God. And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And many of the great saints in the Bible and throughout history have experienced difficulties and trials and tribulation. So, Romans 8.28 is a verse that we always love to uh, quote. And we are all familiar with this verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And what is that purpose that God has called us into? It doesn't say that everything in life will be good. He works for the good. So even the bad things, they can work out for our own good. At the end of the day, when you put together everything, all the experiences you've had in life, at the end of the day, it can turn out for good. It can accomplish God's purpose. And verse 29, the most neglected verse, and yet it's the most important verse, that purpose is so that you and I may be conformed to the image of His Son. You see, God's ultimate goal is Christ-likeness. So you and I can become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So you and I can experience the fruit of the Spirit. You see, if God wants me to learn patience, then friends, He will not surround me with all good people, all smiling people, all people that I, you know, I can go along with. If He wants to teach me patience, He will give me some people who will be so hard to get along with. You know, he will give me an office mate who's a loud mouth and who backstabs. I mean, these people can teach me patience. And so God can allow all of these things in order to conform us into the likeness of His Son. So what's the definition of, of uh, biblical success? Friends, if you have your pen, you have your book in there, be sure to write this down. Success is the progressive realization of God-given goals. Success is the progressive realization of God-given goals. It is the progressive realization of God-given goals. And you know what that implies, friends? You know what that means? If success is the progressive realization of God-given goals, that means, friends, you need to find out what God wants you to do. You need to find out what God wants you to be. You need to find out what God wants you to have and then to do it, to be it, and to have it, and then you progressively realize those goals. You are a successful person. Finding what God wants you to do. Finding what God wants you to be. Finding what God wants you to have. I don't know if it's God's will for me to have a BMW, I do not know. But you know, God will tell me sometime later in life, Roy, I want you to have a BMW. All right. So that will be success for me if that's what God wants me to have. What God wants us to be, what God wants us to do. And so brothers and sisters, that would be success indeed. And so success here, friends, would be contrasted to worldly kind of success, to godly success. There will be choices whether you focus on your comfort or your character. There will be choices this year whether you just focus on your income or your integrity. 
Whether you just invest time on developing your outward self or your inward, inward self, whether this will be self-centered pursuit or a Christ-centered pursuit of your life, or whether you will have success man's way or God's way. And therefore, if we want to be truly successful in 2015, brothers and sisters, that means we need to look carefully to the involvements. What are the things that you will be involved in this year? What are those investments that you want to make this year? What are those intercessions? What are those prayer things? What are those prayer items that you really want to pray? And friends, even the interruptions of life can be God's way of uh, giving us a way of success, even those interruptions. And I was telling uh, my wife yesterday, I want to buy, uh, to give everybody a gift today. Each one of you will receive a gift. You know, it's like the size of a, uh, of a uh, credit card, but it's not a credit card. And so I was asking her if we can go and buy, you know what, what this thing that I had in mind was a mirror. Everybody gets a mirror. You know, if you can just get a mirror and look at yourself. You know, at the start of this year, look at yourself. You know, you can add face value to yourself by just smiling. You know, some people, they really need to smile. You know, the moment you see them, immediately it's like they have lost their sanctification. You know, they, 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 they wear always a, a long face. And I want you this year to be smiling. There's so much to smile about, but you know, you need that mirror to practice your smile because some smile, you know, it's a silly smile. Some kind of smile, it's snobby kind of smile. There are others, it's a simple smile, but what I want you to have is a sweet smile. So try practicing, you know, looking at yourself in a mirror and have a sweet smile. And uh, just telling people that I am blessed. God indeed is at work in my life. And so, 2015, we want to focus on the word success. I'll be sharing with you this afternoon one from the New Testament, the secrets of success, and then the Old Testament next Sunday, the secret of success. I'm doing right now a study on the life of Joshua. And you know, Joshua is a very interesting character. It's always a good start because he's about to go into a new venture. Moses just died. And Joshua is filling up these big shoes of Moses and uh, leading these people. You know, that tells me immediately that even when a leader dies, God's purposes will continue. Amen? Yeah. Even though Moses died, it doesn't mean that's the end of God's purpose. You know, sometimes people can be so focused so much on people. They are focused so much on leaders, they are focused so much on their pastor, that when the pastor dies, it's like the end of the world. The church cannot go on because the pastor already died. Friends, God's purposes continues even when there's a change of leadership. Amen? Amen. And so we don't focus on people, we focus on God's purpose. And we know God's purpose for Chapter Life Center Scarborough. Amen. Amen. Amen? We know that He wants us to multiply, He wants us to disciple so that we can reach out to others who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. So how to succeed in 2015? This will be our focus and we'll be, we'll be looking at the book of Romans. And this book of Romans, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote. You know, this is one book that really made so much impact in Christianity. I mean, scholars or archaeologists, they were able to dig up about 40,000 letters from the from the ancient world. And of all the 14,000 letters, do you know that the most ancient letter, the longest of these ancient letters is the book of Romans, 7,000 words. And this is the letter that changed Martin Luther. That's, that's an actual picture of the, of the uh, manuscript of the uh, book of Romans. This is what changed Martin Luther and this is what started the Reformation. The book of Romans is what challenged uh, John Wesley and this is this is what ignited the great Wesleyan revival and so brothers and sisters we have in this afternoon the privilege to experience the same power that James Martin Luther that challenged John Wesley make that same impact in our lives today so we're looking at 
Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, you can open to that. And of course, you have your bulletin ready to take down notes. But I'd like for us to stand together and read these two verses of Romans chapter 12. All together now, ready to read. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we stand before you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, our heart's desire is to truly listen to you, to hear from you. Lord, 2015 is before us now. So many things will change this year. There will be challenges this year. But Father God, Lord, we thank you that you will never change. You remain the same. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And that, Lord, you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Father God, Lord, our hearts desire what you want us to do this year. We want to be successful. But, Lord, we need your guidance now. And so we pray that your spirit will move in our midst, cleanse us, prepare us, that each one of us will leave this sanctuary with a special message from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. You may take your seats. Again, people today are seeking all sorts of spiritual experiences in order to receive more from God. But you know what? When you read the book of Romans, you'll find out that it's not so much of receiving from God as it is more of giving back to God. Because God has already showered us with every spiritual blessing. You see, you and I, if you are born again Christian, you already receive every blessing in the heavens. The problem a lot of times is we do not know what we possess. You know, there are some Christians, they don't read their Bibles. They're not really aware that the promises that are for them. They're not really aware of the, the good things that God has already showered them with. They're not aware. You know, like, like Bertha Adams, the true story when she was found dead in her little shop and uh, people, the investigators look into her little shop or like a nipa hut in our case in the Philippines and it was just a disheveled place like a pig pen but they found out that there were two keys in her little shop and these two keys led them to the back the, uh, the box in the back one key revealed that this woman owed more than $500,000 in just one box in the back. The other one, she has several titles. And yet people were so surprised that she lived in this little shack, just receiving clothing from the from, from uh, Salvation Army and then getting money, from, getting food from the food bank. And yet, there in her little shop were these more than $500 million. Wow! Can you imagine going through life, begging, not knowing that you are a child of the king, that you are rich, and that God has blessed you with all the spiritual blessings? And so friends, here in Romans chapter 12, after concluding 11 chapters of profound and thrilling doctrine that defines what God has already given us, the Apostle Paul is now going to tell us what we need to give in return. Because of all the blessings that he has given us, what do we need to give in return? You know, it's easy to outline this whole book. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 were towards the end of the book. But the first two chapters of the book talks about sin. And then you read about the litany of sins that were present during that time. This is where you read about homosexuality. Do you know that of the first uh, 14 Roman emperors, 12 or 13 were homosexuals? And that's why you read there the practice of, of, of uh, homosexuality. And then the next three chapters, it talks about salvation. 
So he talks about the problem, but he talks about the solution. And then in chapter 6 to 8, he talks about sanctification. Not only do we have the, the salvation from, you know, from sin, the, the penalty of sin, but we are also being saved from the power of sin. Not only the penalty, but the power. And then 9 to 11 talks about sovereignty of God. And here it talks about, in particular, as it relates to the Jewish people, and uh, God's people, He is going to go back. There's a remnant right now that is being prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, starting with chapter 12 to 16, the Apostle Paul talks about service. So here, He takes us from the gateway of surrender to the pathway of service. God wants not only saved Christians, He wants serving Christians. You know, it's not enough to be saved. We need to be serving. We need to give something back to God because of all the blessings that we have received. And so here in chapter 12, verse 1, starts out with the word, therefore. The word, therefore, I urge you. You know, whenever you read the word, therefore, especially in the letters of the Apostle Paul, you, you take a special note of it because it talks about a transition. There's a transition of thought. <laughs> Somehow is giving us a summary of what transpired before this. And you'll notice the first therefore in Romans is chapter 3 verse 20. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in the sight by, in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. This is the, the uh, therefore of condemnation. And here the great thing is the theme of sin. The next, therefore, you will find in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the therefore of justification. And here the great thing is salvation. And then when you read the book of Romans, the next, therefore, the great transition here is chapter 8, <laughs> verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the therefore of celebration. And here we have the theme of security. Not only will God uh, save us, but He seals us. He secures us with the Holy Spirit. And then finally, when you read chapter 12, verse 1, this is the therefore of dedication. The therefore of dedication. And here, the great theme is that of service. The theme of service. And so, when we start reading chapter 12, verse 1, friends, the Apostle Paul has just showed us the many blessings that we've already received. And now, it's time to serve. Not so much we, what we get from God, but now, it's time to get back, uh, to give back to God. And so, in the opening words, in chapter 12, verse 1, he said, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. If you're using the NIV, it's, it's, it's singular mercy. But again, in the original, the word mercy here is plural. And so we could translate it this way, in view of God's mercies. In view of God's mercies. And the Apostle Paul, from chapter 1 up to chapter 11, before he started chapter 12, he just enumerated, he just demonstrated the manifold demonstration of God's mercy. For example, in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul talks to the people in Rome, the Christians, who are loved by God. You see that word, loved by God. You know, it's so easy to doubt the love of God. This year, as I've said, there might be challenges. There will be changes, that's for sure. You will be one year older this year. But who knows, there might even be a crisis this year. But friends, it's so easy to forget that you are loved by God. When you're experiencing all these problems, come on, tell the one sitting beside you, you are loved by God. You are loved by God. Whatever happens this year, friends, be assured, you are loved by God. Not only that, God says here, you are called to be what? You are called to be saints. Can you imagine that? You are called to be saints. Come on, tell the one sitting beside you, you are a saint. Come on. You are a saint. I know if you're talking to your husband, Imagine this husband of yours is a saint. Wow. Parang nakakakilabot na kanya. But you know what, friends? This is what, how God views us. You and I are saints of God. 
You are no longer sinners. I mean, we are saints who sometimes sin, but friends, we are no longer sinners. We need to change our mindset because if you go out of this building believing that you are still a sinner, then friends, you will do what a sinner does. But if you go out of this building believing that you are a saint of God, you have been washed in the blood, you have been reserved for God's purpose, you are holy already <laughs> before God's sight. That means, friends, it will change the way you go to work tomorrow morning. You know you're a saint of God going to work. It will change the way you work. You know when your office mates are backstabbing you or gossiping against you or, you know, doing things against you. You're a saint of God. It will make a difference the way you respond. It will make a difference the way you treat your husband or the way you treat your wife. It will make a difference the way you treat your children. If you're a saint, it will make a difference the way you drive on 401. How oh, I tell you, the saints of God, when they drive on 401, you know, they just stick to 100 or 120, and that's it. Because you're a saint of God. You know, it's so hard to drive 140, and then you're asking God for protection. You know, the Bible says the angels surround you. The angels cannot surround you because they're running 100 only. They, they keep the, the speed limit and you're running 140, so they're already behind you. You don't have God's protection there. Stick to God's law. Alright? You are a saint of God. You are loved by God. Chapter 2, he said, we have experienced His kindness, His tolerance, His patience. Chapter 3, we have righteousness that comes through faith. Chapter 4, he talks about being forgiven. Our sins are covered. Our sins will never be taken against us or cut against Him. And then chapter 5, he talks about pouring out His love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Chapter 6, he talks about being set free from sin. Chapter 7, he talks about being rescued from this body of death through the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 8, he talks about receiving the spirit of sonship, and that's why we call him Abba Father. Chapter 9, he talks about obtaining righteousness by faith. We are now righteous before God. Chapter 10, he talks about being saved, being justified, and that's why in chapter 11, he gave this, uh, this series of thoughts. He said, all the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his justice and his paths beyond tracing out, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. 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 Wow. 11 chapters of God's mercies. And therefore in chapter 12, when we, when we move into service, you see, as Christians, we should never be satisfied of being saved. You know, I feel so bad. Some Christians, they just come to church and sit in their favorite pew, sit in the favorite seat, and they don't do anything. Yeah. They're just satisfied that they're going to heaven, but they're not doing anything. Chapter 12, the Apostle Paul said, what should be our response since we have received so much, yet deserve nothing? What should be our response? And so here he opened up by saying, therefore I urge you, brothers, the word urge, it means to come alongside it means to exhort with tenderness. You know, can you imagine the Apostle Paul, even though he had the authority of the Apostle, he puts his hand on your shoulder and is encouraging you like a brother. He's not imposing, you know, he's encouraging. He's coming alongside, exhorting you. And then look at this. It says there very clearly, therefore I urge you, who? Brothers. <laughs> you see, friends, this exhortation can only be applied by brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. What you're about to read, if you haven't surrendered your life to Him, friends, it's just impossible for you to apply. I can tell you right now, even for us Christians, it's so hard. But because of the Holy Spirit who is in us, that's why we are able to, to uh, fulfill and obey this exhortation in Romans chapter 12. So, if you're not yet born again, that's the first step, all right? You're about to hear some words that will be very hard to swallow, very hard to uh, obey. But brothers, and so here he said, therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercies, okay, we already retranslated the word mercy, mercies, and then to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. 
or living sacrifices to God. Wow! So friends, first of all, the first secret of success is total dedication. The first secret of success is total dedication. If you want to be successful this year, <coughs> brothers and sisters, in your walk, in your service, and in the endeavor that you are in, you need to understand this secret. God is not asking for 50% dedication. He's not asking for 90%. He's not even asking for 99.9%. Friends, He's asking for total 100% dedication. Now, all the people who are here in this sanctuary, I believe the people who can truly understand what total dedication means are the ladies. You know, these women, they can understand what total dedication means. That's what you want from your husband, isn't it? You want total dedication. Now, let's just assume for a minute or two here that you're still single. All the women can raise your hand, all the women. Okay, women, raise your hand. If you're not sure you're a woman, <laughs> but all the women, raise your hand, all right? Now, let me see the hands of those who are already married. Can you raise your hand? Those who are already married? Okay. Now, let's make an assumption here. Let's assume that you're not yet married. Okay, let's assume you're still single. Okay, now, tomorrow is your big day. It's your wedding day, the grand day, your wedding. And then, today is your last day to be single. Tomorrow you'll be double, all right? <laughs> but on that last night, your husband-to-be visited you in your hotel room because you already booked a garden wedding in that hotel. And so drop by your bed, drop by your, your hotel room, and then he held your hands, looked straight to your eyes, and then he said, honey bunch, <laughs> sweetie pie, cinnamon bread. <laughs> Tomorrow you'll be mine and I'll be yours. I'm going to dedicate myself to you 364 days of every year. I'm totally yours. 364 days of every year. And then you think, honey, honey, wait a minute. Aren't there 365 days in every year? And then this husband-to-be says to you, honey, can I just have one day to meet with my old girlfriend? Just one day in a year. But 364, I'm totally yours, 100%. Now, with that kind of agreement, who among the women here, remember you're still single now, are going to continue the wedding the following day? Raise your hand. Those who are going to continue with the wedding. With that kind of arrangement. Pag nagtas ka ng kamay, talagang disperado ka na. You're really desperate, you really want to get married. But friends, the women, they understand what total dedication means. It's not 99.9%, it's 100%. And yet, you know what? This is the kind of dedication many Christians are giving to the Lord. Lord, I want to commit my life to you every Sunday. But Monday, Lord is mine. That's football night. Lord, Friday is mine because that's 10 God's Friday. You know, we want to reserve some days. We want to reserve some rooms in our in our house. We want to reserve some video days. We want to reserve some, some websites that we can visit. Friends, total dedication means 100% you're committed to the Lord. Without this, friends, it will be very hard to really have the kind of success that God wants you to have. Total dedication. And here the Apostle Paul added a word, of course, the word sacrifices right there. Sacrifices. Total de dedication involves sacrifice. Amen? I mean, it was a sacrifice, I know, for some of you to drive all the way to come here last Wednesday night to have our countdown. I know it's a sacrifice. For some people, you know, they're not so used to, you know, going out up to 12 midnight. We stay there up to 2 o'clock in the morning because some people, they still want to dance. So we have to stay up to 2 o'clock in the morning. And I was so scared with Luella dancing and bouncing with, with that big tummy there. And 
but she just wants to dance. I know it's a sacrifice for some people, but you know what, friends? When we try to find ways to keep the harmony, you know, the unity in the family, and are willing to make that sacrifice, willing to make that one step, just to be able to encourage people, just to make our tribe complete, and we are there. Oh, friends, that kind of sacrifice, it means a lot to the body of Christ. It means a lot. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the story when we talk about sacrifice, about the story of this, this uh, chicken and this pig. They were walking one time and they passed by a church and the sideboard in this church, it says accepting donations to feed the poor. And then the chicken said to the pig, wouldn't it be nice to get involved in this? How about if I donate some eggs and you donate a ham? <laughs> <laughs> and the pig complained, he said, not so fast. For you it would just be a donation, but for me it would be a sacrifice. <laughs> you see, that's the difference. You know, some people in church are willing to make a donation, but they don't want to make a sacrifice. And it's so hard to find people who are willing to take that extra step, to stretch the dollar and give some more, because it's for the Lord's work. It's easy to make a donation, but to make that sacrifice, wow. Now that's maturity. You know that God is working in this person's life. And so here in Apostle Paul, we can read this all together now. <coughs> he said, all together, let me read. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Again, the Apostle Paul added an adjective here because the kind of sacrifice they have in the Old Testament, they're so aware of sacrifices, but they are all dead sacrifices. I mean, they have to slit the throat of these lamb first before they are put on top of the altar and then the fire to consume the body. It's all dead sacrifice. But friends, God wants us to offer a living sacrifice. Now what does that mean? A living sacrifice. You know martyrs, they die. They want to make a sacrifice by dying. But brothers and sisters, what God wants from us is to sacrifice by living for Him. You know which is harder? Come to think of it, which is harder? To die for Him or to live for Him? Which is harder do you think? To die for Him or to live for Him? To die for him is harder. It's a day-to-day -day battle. It's a day-to-day -day decision. When you go through martyrdom, it's a one-time decision. You die for him. But every day to die for him, a living sacrifice. I love this uh, translation by Eugene Peterson. He said, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Place it before God as an offer. By the way, when I mentioned the uh, countdown, I know that there are reasons, valid reasons why people cannot come. That's okay, no problem. You know, we, we can accept that. The thing is, we only do this every other year, all right? So we just want you to know that 2015, it's an odd year, plan your own countdown. You can do it with your own family, you can do it with your own tribe, try to have something that you can look forward to. But every even year, 2016, we'll have again the whole church getting involved. Amen? Amen. So again, I know that uh, some are not feeling well and some, you know, they have to do something. That's okay, no problem. But here, the, the, uh, the translation that we have here is it's an everyday, ordinary life. You're eating, sleeping, going to work, walking around life and place it before the altar. So brothers and sisters, total dedication, it means to commit ourselves to God, to yield ourselves to Him, to surrender to Him, to abandon ourselves to Him, to entrust ourselves to Him, and place ourselves completely on the altar. And you know when they offer those sacrifices, there's no such thing as a partial offering. It's a burnt whole offering. They'll burn the whole thing. 
It's not just, Lord, I'll just offer my arm. Lord, I'll just offer my leg. It's a whole world offer. So again, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's verses, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Again, the word bodies that the Apostle Paul tried to emphasize here. Do you know that in the Bible, it talks a lot about our bodies. And this is one thing that the Lord wants us to offer to Him, our bodies. For example, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, the Apostle Paul wrote here, he said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be what? Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So we are to exalt Christ with our bodies, whether by life or by death. I know that some people, they, they became Christians because of somebody dying. You know, when they saw this Christian believer who was willing to accept death, who was not afraid to die, even in the face of, difficult, of uh, a difficult situation, going through cancer, but their courage, their joy, it was still there. And you know what happened? People got converted because of that testimony. And that's what it means, whether by life or by death. We glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, the Apostle Paul again wrote here in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? That's the temple of the Holy Spirit. I know for some it's more of a basilica of the Holy Spirit. But you know, it's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, what does it say? Honor God with your body. And this is what we talked about two Sundays ago. Remember when I gave you an illustration about smoking? You know, when you smoke, uh, I, I already asked some people here who smoke before they became Christians. Now, what I'm so concerned are those already Christians and they still smoke. Now, that's a real concern because you have to honor God with your body. We already know the effect of smoking. It's a silent killer. It's killing me softly. You know? Smoking is just killing me softly. Now again, we're not saying, we're not doubting that you're a Christian if you smoke. But as a Christian, you should not smell like hell. You know? And so we want you to be ready for heaven. But again, when you just stop smoking, then you are glorifying God, honoring God with your body. First Corinthians 6.20, and of course the worst sin of, of, of all is sexual immorality, and he talked about that in that letter also. So here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying that we are to offer our bodies to God. And we have different instruments in our bodies. You know, you have a, a wonderful, magnificent moving camera in your body, and that's the eye. You have a wonderful broadcasting system in your body, and that's the human voice. You have a tremendous receiving system, and that's the human ears. And then you have a, an intricate, sophisticated tool in your body, and that's the human hand. Now, all these instruments, they can be used for righteousness or for wickedness. And the Apostle Paul is saying, be very practical with your sacrifice, offer your bodies to Him. Because friends, you know and I know that you can use your eyes as a pornographic camera and watch pornographic films. You can visit pornographic websites. You can use your voice as a, as, a, uh, as a way to spew out filth. And you know, it's sad that there are Christians being, uh, working in, in an environment where everybody's cursing, everybody saying F you or Jesus Christ, or they, they use all these words, and it's so sad that they're Christians, they're so carried into that system, and they still use the same words. It doesn't make any difference when you say, use those words. You can use your mouth as a sewer to spew out filth. Or you can use your ears to receive filthy gossip. You know when a brother or sister talks about talks to you against somebody else, immediately that should ring a bell. This is gossip. Because if this person is really concerned about that person, he should talk to that person in the first place, not to you. And so, try to find a way. Maybe you're the bridge that God can use so that these two people can talk together. 
the book allow your ears to receive those filthy gospel. And again, you can use your hands to do wickedness. And so here the Apostle Paul, he said, once and for all, he said, therefore I urge you, brothers, to offer your bodies. And very interesting, the word offer here, in the every sense, it's to offer once and for all. Offer it once and for all. Now what does that mean? You know, just like in a wedding, you make that offering to your wife, to your husband. You make that one-time offering. It's a once and for all. I mean, even though you celebrate 25 years or 50 years and you do some, you know, exchange of vows, re, uh, what do you call that? A renewal of your vows. But you know what, friends? The vows that you made 50 years ago is still valid. It's still the same. It's still valid. It's a once and for all thing. But true enough, every year or every significant year we, we make a renewal of vows but it doesn't violate or it doesn't negate the very first time we, we did it. That's what it means to offer once and for all. Make a decision. This is what Peter was talking about when he said, you have had enough time in the past of the evil things that God's people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness. What parties and their terrible worship of idols. Of course your former friends are very surprised when you no longer join. Now put a stop to it. Stop, stop offering liquor. You know, stop doing things that you used to do. Make yourself different. Not for the sake of just being different, but to make a difference. And then the Apostle Paul said this, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to its lustful desires. Do not let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness to be used for sin. Instead, he said, give yourselves completely to God. That's total dedication. Since you have been given your life and use your body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. So friends, this year, 2015, let's be conscious. You want to be successful? Do it God's way. Be conscious of doing it for the glory of God. So friends, if I ask you right now, has there been a definite point in your life when you definitely offered yourself to God? Has there been a definite point in your life? Friends, this is a prayer I would encourage you to pray the moment you wake up in the morning before you grab your cell phone and check if there's any text message that came in last night. Before you meet another soul, pray this prayer. Let's all pray this prayer, all of us please. Ready? Pray. Oh God, I offer my eyes to you. I'll see what you want me to see. Dear God, I'll give my ears to you today to hear only what you want me to hear. I offer this mouth to you, Lord, to say only what you want me to say. Oh God, I give my hands to you today to do only what you want me to do. Lord, I give my feet to you today to walk only where you want me to walk. Oh God, I give you my desires and thoughts today. You and you alone, I want to please today. Lord, be glorified in my life today. You know, if you make that prayer every day, the moment you wake up, before you meet another person, just you and God, committing your body to the Lord, your instruments to the Lord. Friends, it can make a difference. In the way you meet that day. In the way you will respond that day. In the way you will work that day. If you make that kind of prayer. And the Apostle Paul said, this is what is holy and pleasing to God. That means this is what is really pleasing to the Lord. This is what He really wants. Your bodies. Because God knows if He got your body, then He's got you. And then He said, this is your spiritual worship. Now that word spiritual there is different from the King James Version because in the King James Version it says which is your reasonable worship. There's a difference here in the translation and I use spiritual, reasonable, but in the original it's logikos and logikos is where we got the word logic. And so what it is saying is that when you make this offering, when you offer your bodies to God, this is just the logical expression of your thankfulness to God. It's the most logical, the most practical thing. You can do in response to what God has done for you. You know, you're not giving God a favor when you offer your body to Him. It's just logical. It's just practical. 
It's the natural response to God. You don't count, you don't compute on God. Lord, I cannot take this brother or sister. May gasoline, you know, you cannot go and pass by going to the tribe meeting. You cannot do this. You cannot compute on God. Because if God started start computing on you, wow. I tell you, you won't stay in that house where you're staying right now. You won't have that car to drive right now. You won't have that job to work on right now. If God starts computing on you, you don't compute on God. You just respond to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And that's why this year, be sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit. There are certain promptings. There are certain things that He wants you to do. And when you do what He wants you to do, you are successful. What He wants you to be, what He wants you to have, if it's God's way for you to have that car, God will give you the car. That will be success, that will be prosperity. And so friends, think of what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. I mean, we can never repay God. So everything that we do this year is just an expression of our thankfulness to God. The suffering He he made for us the blood that he shed, you know, the excruciating pain he had to go through just to buy us out of, uh, of suffering in hell. And therefore, here's what the Apostle Paul said. All of, us, all of us together now, we've analyzed the passage, ready, read. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. How to succeed in 2015? Number one, total dedication. And then number two, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Very quickly now, number two, write down the word radical separation. Radical separation. Now when I use the word radical, I'm not referring to a fanatical way to separate ourselves from the non-Christians, we're not talking about attacking people and smashing their idols and burning churches. You know, that's not the kind of radicalism that we're talking about here. But the Apostle Paul made it very clear. He said, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. And the word world here is cosmos. It means the present age. It means the evil system. You see, whether we like it or not, friends, we live, we rub shoulders with people who imbibe the values of this world. We are in an evil system. This present age, the moral standards of this world is different from ours. And that's why we talked to the young people last Sunday. You know, you need to set your own standards for dating. You need to set your own standards for these things because you cannot just pattern yourself after the world. You need to have your own standards. You need to value education. You need to set a goal and, and fulfill that goal and to graduate and to finish work and you know, all those things. And the word conform, again, that's being plugged into the system of this world, <laughs> but to conform, it means to assume an outward expression that does not come from within. Do you see that? You see, what it's saying is that if you're a real Christian and you're conforming to the world, that's not true who you are. You're just conforming to the outward, to the world around you. But that's not who you really are. And that's why what it means is say, it's saying, stop assuming an outward expression which is patterned after this word, an expression which does not come from your inner being as a regenerated child of God. So that's an outward form. Stop assuming an outward form. I love the New Living Translation. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a person by changing the way you think. I love the translation. New Living Translation. Did you get that? Wow. It captures exactly what the word conform means. In the Phillips Translation, it says, Don't let the world around you squish you into its mold. Squish you into its mold. 
And you know what happened to our brother Lot in the Old Testament? And he allowed the world of Sodom and Gomorrah to squeeze him into its mold. And it's sad. When Christians are like that, we live in a postmodern world here in Canada. And, uh, you know, every commercial that comes out right now, there's this commercial of a detergent, but then it's a uh, both male, you know, the uh, husband and wife, they're both male. So they're projecting it now very clearly in the commercials, in many of the movies. You know, they're trying to glamorize sexual immorality. They're trying to normalize same sex marriage. You know, that's the pattern of this world. Now I know that I can be sued the way I talk like this, you know, because it's already illegal in some uh, uh, states in America to talk like this. You can go to jail if you talk like this. But you know what, friends, that's the world we are in. And if you allow the world to just squish you to its mold, then friends, you've lost it. You've lost your sense of morality, you've lost your, your godly perspective, you will lose your peace of mind, and you will lose your testimony. And that's what happened to Job. And that's why, young people, be careful with these questions, try to analyze them carefully. Where do you get your standards for your behavior? Do you just copy what the, what the uh, Hollywood stars are doing? On what basis do you decide on what is right and what is wrong? Is it really just the majority, majority rule? Now friends, when it comes to morality, the majority does not rule. The word of God rules when it comes to morality. Are your opinions formed by what you see on television or what you read in magazines and books? And just very quickly now, I love this story about Pastor Joe Wright. He was asked to open the new session, uh, the new session, the Kansas State. Uh, everyone was expecting the usual generalities, but instead, this is what they heard when he prayed, the opening prayer. He said, Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what we have done. You know today, they call evil good. If something is really good, they will say, that's bad, that's bad. You know, it's really very good, that's evil, but that's evil. You know, they reverse the, the connotation of the word. If it's good, you'd say it's bad. Man, doesn't it look bad? But what they mean is it's really good. You know, they've reversed it. Call evil good, but that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have exploited the poor and called it lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have endorsed perversion and called it alternative lifestyle. By the way, this laziness and called it welfare, you know, sometimes even Christians, they do this. You know, they resign from, or they, they quit from their job or they've been fired out and then they, they get the, uh, what do you call it? The EI and then they actually work secretly and receiving the email at the same time. You know, it's so sad that even Christians, they fall into this just to get more money from the government. And, and we, we, we do this, it's so sad. I know of a couple, and again, I don't have, it's not, you know, from here in Canada, but I won't tell you which province. <laughs> they separated. I won't tell you which province in Canada. They separated. And because the wife is now a, what do you call it? Single mother, she gets uh, money from the government as her sister. But then the husband secretly goes every night and sleep <laughs> just to get the money. And they're both of them are Christians. They're attending a Christian church. I tell you, it's so sad that people just because of money, to gain some money, they're willing to twist the truth of God. You know, rewarded listeners to call welfare, we have endorsed perversion and called it alternative lifestyle. Father, in the name of choice, we have killed our unborn. And then in the name of right to life, we have killed abortions. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it 
beloved men, we confess that we have ridiculed the absolute truths of your word in the name of moral pluralism. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Amen. And you know, after that, there was an uproar and he was banned from ever again praying in the Kansas State Session Room. The world doesn't want it. They, want us, they don't want us to speak against the standards of this world. But brothers and sisters, as surely as God will move in this world, it says here, you'll never go wrong when you go God's way, but you'll, when you go outside of God's way, you'll never be wrong. When you go outside of God's way, you'll never be wrong. How to succeed? Finally, number three. Total dedication, radical separation, and now personal transformation. Personal transformation. So here the Apostle Paul made it very clearly, but he said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So friends, that's how we get transformed. That's how we change. Transformation is by renewing our minds. And very interesting, the word transform is that's where we that's from the word metamorphumai. And obviously we know the English word that got uh, we got from that word, and that's the word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. And so here the apostle Paul is the same, but be metam metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. That's how we change. It's an inside job. It's from the inside and then coming out. It's not just the pressure from the outside. You know, it's not just a set of rules. It's not just a set of laws that have been uh, given to the land. That changes from the inside. Have you noticed that when you go back to the Philippines? The way you drive? You know, here in Canada, you're very careful. But when you go back to the Philippines, it's the same kind of driving. Bara bara, you know, some people. Because it's just an outside rule. It doesn't change. The change is not coming from the inside. Just because there are no laws in the Philippines against this kind of driving, then you just drive the way you want to drive. That change is temporal, transitory. But friends, the change that God wants is from the inside going out. And this is why the Apostle Paul said these words. He said, Therefore, if anybody be in Christ, he said, You what? He's a new creation. He's a new creation. I mean, your face looks the same. I know you wanted so much when I get born again. I want my face to change, but I'm sorry, that's not part of the promise of God. But, friends, it's more than that. It's not just the cosmetic changes. It's the change from the inside out. And so finally, we have it all there. Total dedication, radical separation, and then personal transformation. And the Apostle Paul said, if we have all three, then friends, we are on the path of success. This is success God's way. Not the world's way, but God's way of success. You need to listen to God. What are the things He wants you to do? You need to find out what are the things He wants you to be. Find out what are the things He wants you to have. And then friends, follow God's way. Total dedication, radical separation, personal transformation. And I tell you, God is so pleased to prosper His children. God is more than pleased. He's so happy to bless His children. So you will be blessed. You will be blessed this 2015. Amen? Amen. We will receive God's blessing this 2015. Let me call the worship team now. Uh, let's just take this time to just, uh, you know, put a seal to our commitment this afternoon. I do not know what your fears are for this year. I do not know what your plans are. But friends, one thing I'm sure about, God wants you to succeed. God wants you to prosper. But there are things in our lives that we need to offer back to God. And again, I do not know exactly what that is. But we're going to pray after we sing this song, while we're singing this song. And just make a commitment to the Lord as we dedicate our lives to Him.
Come on, let's all stand. The worship team will just lead us in this one song. And if you're here this afternoon and you heard God talking to you, again, I do not know what God spoke to you about. But if you're serious with your walk with God and you want God to really bless you this year, you need to take that step. Take that step. Step of faith. And commit this part of your life to God. Maybe you want to come forward and just say to the Lord, Lord, I want to commit 2015 to you. Maybe you are here, you just want to, Lord, I want to commit my family to you. Maybe it's just your work. Maybe it's just your son, your daughter. Maybe it's your body. Whatever it is. And you're saying to God, Lord, prosper me this year. God, grant me success. Let's sing this. And then we'll have one prayer for everybody who will come forward and make that dedication to the Lord.
exactly what's going on in our hearts and in our minds right now. Lord, you know the reason why we came forward. Lord, you know what our life must be in this 2014. Lord, you know those dreams that we've had that's still not yet fulfilled. Lord, you know the plans that we have set for this year. But Almighty God, Lord, as we come forward, we acknowledge that our lives belong to you, Lord. Lord, we want to make this offering right now. Lord, we offer to you our bodies. Lord, we offer to you our time. Lord, we offer to you our bodies. Lord, we offer to you whatever dream, whatever desire that is in our hearts. Lord, that prayer, that longing that we have in our heart for that relationship to Him. Lord, I pray right now that this relationship will heal. Lord, this year will be a year of reconnection. Lord, a year where we can rejoin, Lord, with our loved ones, with our friends. Lord, this year will be an abundant year to win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for your hand of success to be upon your children. Lord, that you grant them the desires of their hearts, Lord, as they offer these things to you to glorify you, to expand your kingdom. That, Lord, you will use them in ways you have never used them before. Lord, may this year indeed be a year of prosperity, a year of success. Almighty God, Lord, that your name will be glorified in our midst, will be glorified in our offices, will be glorified in our schools, will be glorified in our families. Almighty God, Lord, we thank you for what is in store for us this year. We know that you are there for us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, it pleases you to bless your children. It pleases you to prosper your children. It pleases you to make your children successful. And so Lord, now. We claim this prosperity now. We claim this victory now in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you have uh, taught us, Lord, for the things that you have reminded us, reminded us with. And so, Father God, Lord, we just pray right now. Bless everyone, Lord, who came forward. Lord, you know exactly what they need. And in Jesus' name, Lord, we ask from this day forward, they will see the fruition of this dream. They will see that success. They will see that prosperity. Lord, they will see your hand moving in their lives and they will be able to deny you but glorify you Lord, for it. And so Lord, we just want you to be lifted up in our lives, in our church, in our families. Lord, you and to you alone below all the glory, all the power, all the blessings. We acknowledge you, Lord. Thank you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord.